Knockback, the retro and nostalgia podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Knockback. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother, Dagan. You coming back to the sack or what? Moriarty. <laughs> you threw me a curve with that one. I didn't see yeah. that one coming. Here's right. why I'm yeah. not going to start with one, two, Dagan's coming for you. Because yeah. then you're going to make some off-colored coming for you joke. Yeah. And I just oh. don't need it. Oh. Well, it's funny, you say, it it's, it's funny you say that, actually, because Luke Tucker wrote into us on Patreon and says, one, two, Dagan's coming for you. <laughs> Three, four, late fees at the store. Five, six, buried out in the sticks. Seven, eight, got to dig it up late. What? Nine, ten, never watching the VHS again. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. How did he try? If that would that would have been extra per first of all, that was great. I give you a hundred percent. Hundred ten percent Luke if that was actually a nightmare. Check plus. Yeah. On Elm Street rather than Bram Stoker's Cold Yeah, he Dracula. put it all together there. Very uh, nice. It, it's still within the horror genre, so right. Brownie points. Yeah, he 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 wanted to call make that call back. We won't get quite into the topic just yet. That's that's not the that's not how we do things here. <laughs> that's Welcome not how to- we do. Welcome to Knockback, our retro and nostalgia podcast. We put it up each and every week. You can get it early and ad free over on Patreon, patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Many thousands of you support us over there, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, Of course, supporting us there also gets you perks for Sacred Symbols, the PlayStation podcast, the world's most beloved PlayStation podcast, and Defining Duke, an Xbox podcast as well. And uh, submit your questions, get your name in the credits, Sacred Symbols Plus, Defining Duke Ultimate. There's a whole lot out there, laststandmedia.shop for merch. We are going to be working on our Moriarty Raygun 2024 shirt soon. So we'll get that out to you oh, shortly. That's, that's awesome. And uh, once, yeah, I don't even know when this is going live, but oh, no, I guess it will. I, I'm, we're doing our live show, show very soon. So we'll see you out there. And that will, of course, be live for for everyone uh, on Patreon soon after it happens. You have something to say, Dave? No, I want to see at the live show. I'm very excited. This yeah. is new to me. You know, I want to. Here's what I want to see. And I hope I'm not asking for too much. I want to see a representative from each of the 50 states it's- <laughs> and Canada and Mexico. Like if there's somebody not from Alaska and Hawaii there, I'm not saying continental. I'm saying 50. So not the contiguous, but the, yeah, all of them. I, I expect all 48, but then outside also, and maybe Canada and um, I don't I don't know, maybe even some other countries. I, I want to see a I want to see an international contingent represented at this thing. It's like I don't the United think it's Nations, too much to ask. Basically. Okay, well, if you can't get into the show, I still want to see you in Butler, PA. Yeah, well, we'll see you the next day because we're doing a a, a a a kind of a gathering, some food trucks and everything, uh, in a park the next day after exactly. the show. So, and that's not that's for everybody. So you can come. And you said if people come from out of town, they could stay in your hotel room, right? That's right. Well, I'm actually staying with Dustin, so uh, I think it's <laughs> so I think that they can. Uh, <laughs> they can all stay at Dustin's. Cool. I'm staying. I'm staying. I'm, I'm staying. Yeah, I, I think you are staying at the hotel. The reason I took my myself out of the hotel was just like just remove me because you know we need a room and just take me off the board. You know, so that right. we can focus on getting everyone set up. So yeah, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to what we can learn. I think we've learned much of what we need to learn already, actually. But um, yeah, that's basically. It's that. gonna be so but, nice to see. That's the thing, right? They get to see us all the time, listen mm-hmm. to us, but we never get to see, it's never the other way around. Now the mirror is reversed. We get to see you guys and girls and hear you um, and stay in the hotel room that's now vacant because Colin's not staying in the hotel. Yeah. So right? don't worry about me over there. I'm, I'm disappearing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're looking forward to it and we're going to have a lot of fun. And it's obviously fun. we know... I mean, it sold out almost immediately. So we know that many, many, many people that wanted to go couldn't. And uh, again, this is just just a test run. I think we'll do more of these beginning in 2022, but we'll see. And uh, yeah, otherwise, just just hanging out, doing uh, doing work and preparing for the live show. And well, anything interesting going on in your your neck of the woods? I don't know why I was just thinking about this before the show. I think because I went into the garage and I heard a truck outside. What's your stance on, have we talked about this before? What's your stance on delivery guys? I'm talking UPS, FedEx, US mail, whatever, whoever. Yeah, yeah. 
pulling in the driveway mm. for a delivery. Amazon, of course, is a biggie. What's your stance on that? Should they just pull roadside in, near the house, on the side of the house, in front of the house, or whatever? Or are they do they have your leave to use the driveway? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I do notice that I have like a, an array of cameras outside my house. So like when someone yeah. comes and drops something off, I can see. And sometimes people pull up front, and sometimes people pull in the driveway. I feel like it's a little too familiar. Yeah, pull in like the driveway. The driveway thing. But I also think it's it depends. Like. Uh, <clears throat> Like the for some reason I don't mind so much a pizza guy delivering it if he's like pulling in, but I don't the FedEx guy I just feel like you gotta stay on this. Your house is kind of weird though because you live in such like it's hard to know how to get to your door. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because That's you live true. in this parcel where maybe they're trying to use the driveway to find because otherwise you have to like walk right across your lawn and maybe they feel, yes, there's feel no walkway. Right. Yeah, that's true. I guess yeah. I could kind of leave a little bit of wiggle room for that. But yeah. yeah, it really bothers me when they pull in the driveway. I don't like it. <laughs> so I could get a little too bent, maybe a little too bent out of shape. Yeah, you're not, you're not feeling about that. it. But yeah, I was just wondering what your take was now. Another homeowner thing, another homeowner take. I could talk to you about this stuff now. Yeah, I, you certainly can. I mean, we're just, we're doing our thing. By the way, so we're getting like a bunch of our landscaping redone. So um, because the pool company is like completely destroyed my yard. So which, which was, which was to be expected. Also the pool's like not even remotely done still. Oh but, my um, God. These, these guys, guys are the, these guys are the fucking worst. Holy like shit. They're nice enough, but I just think they're so ahead of their skis. And I'm just like, I, about a month ago, I was just like, you know what? I'm letting this go. Like you're just going to, it's just going to, ha- yeah, it's just going to happen. Like I can't worry about this every day. It's almost comical. It's and the right attitude. It'll get done. Like they just slowly get things done. I'm like, it'll be fine. I'm sure at the end, like I just can't. Because my neighbor would be like, I'd be all over these guys and stuff. And I'd be like, I don't know, man. Oh, no, he's it's, fueling the flames. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm he's like, I'm not, you can't do that. I'm like, I'm not really that kind of person. I'm really just not like I'm ve- not very assertive, you know? And well, no, not even that. Just letting it roll off your shoulders, I think, is the right attitude. Why stress out about something? There's that's nothing I can do about pleasure. it. Like they're not going to do it any quicker. It's mostly done. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the liner so that we can fill it with water. You know? Okay. Okay. And uh, and then they have to do all the landscaping in the back, like the concrete work and stuff like that. But I'm like, I don't know, man. I, I, just months ago, I realized like you guys are just full of shit, and uh, we're already too deep into this. And then I don't know why and- I picture your pool pool guys like Flintstones contractors like they have animals where like yeah. machinery should be <laughs> like the elephants fill in the pool with the concrete right, right. so the- i don't know why i think that just because it's like i think because the progress has been molasses like yeah oh, i mean i mean molasses moves quicker than this so i'm after we're done with the show i'll probably call them and just um and just see what's going on because uh it's so weird though right like i've been in this situation now with the pool but with other stuff yeah well, you do just feel powerless after a fashion. You're just like, all right, you just kind of got to throw your hands up and just acquiesce. It's like, all right, like, I guess it's your call. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. Like, what, you what are you supposed power to power over to them? Yeah, I, I feel like in, in some sense, um, like, I think it's part of who I am. Like, I'm just not a very assertive in your face person. And I'm also afraid of like annoying the people when the job still needs to be done. And uh, I just, I've also talked to some other people where they're like, yeah, pool, building a pool is a disaster. Like I I was, I was talking to some, some dude like dropped off a bunch of sand because they're making like some sort of compound for the concrete. And, and he was, I'm like, yeah, sorry, man, just drop it. And like, he was like, where do you want me to put it? I'm like, literally drop it anywhere because the pool people have just destroyed my yard. And he's like, yeah, pool people do that. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, all right. So I guess, yeah. So I guess this guy knew. And then, um, Aunt Carla, I think, was the one saying to me, she's like, uh, the, the, the old saying about pools is if you want a pool, you really need to want a pool. You know? Yeah. And, and um, it's going to test your your metal as far right. as like, do you really want? I saw so it really, go through so it, like man. when I got through when I got when I dissuaded myself that I'm ever going to get into this thing this year. That's when I was just like, you know, whatever, because it'll just be ready next year. It'll be and then I'll just forget that this ever even happened. So I just well, need to go. I just need to get to that point. I just have too many other things other yeah. things to you got a lot going on, going right on. Yeah. yeah over the long haul that's the right philosophy i think that's the right, right. take huh? and you know what? are you also afraid you were saying a little bit i think you were intimating this like you're afraid being a ball buster might affect the quality of the work not even the quality so much as like their willingness to do it <laughs> 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 because i did get into like one pretty aggressive fight with the dude. like not fight but argument with the dude very uncharacteristic for me Okay. And All right. this was well, months ago though. You know, yeah. Um, 
Now, I understand that there's a lot of things out of their hands. Like, apparently, there's a really bad vinyl issue going on uh, oh. with, like, vinyl production, which is okay. part of our problem. And so I know that some of it's out of your hands. But at the same time, it's like, you got to, like, be more organized and, and stop blaming COVID for everything. It's, it's, you know, it's not over, but it's, come on, you know, it's over. Yes. Like, you should have adapted by now. Exactly. Possibly. So it is what it is. I mean, I'm, well, I'm, I'm very glad lucky to be posted. I'm very that. lucky to be in a position where I can do this at all. But I, uh, yeah, I just, yeah. I wanted the pool so badly. And then when I let go of the, just like, I'm like, I'll just have it next year. I mean, I've waited so long anyway. And then it's like, yeah, okay. There's other things to do. The year's almost over. What are you going to do? I hear you, my friend. I hear you. All right. Dave, the topic at hand, as everyone already knows, because they clicked on this, is A Nightmare on Elm Street, the 1984 horror film from Wes Craven written and directed by Wes Craven. Uh, this movie was made for just a hair over a million dollars, made 50 times that at the box office. Now, I'm curious about your memories of this. This actually came out after I was born, but I was only about a month old when this game uh, or when this movie came out. So I um, obviously didn't see it. And I don't remember when the first time I saw it was, but I saw this movie in dribs and drabs many, many, many times. And then as I got older, you know, I finally sat down and watched it all. And I, I thought I wanted to bring up this topic for multiple reasons. First of all, we're, we're getting towards October from when we're recording this. So maybe start doing some horror stuff. But also, I, f I wanted to watch this movie again because I had this kind of strange feeling where I'm like, I don't think this movie's very good. And I went back and watched it and I'm like, this movie's really not very good. And it's not that it's bad. It's that it doesn't do anything right really with like this really amazing <laughs> idea right it's this really cool idea and awesome none of idea. it and none of it is really very well done i mean that's my opinion I, I just don't think it is and i'm a little surprised how big this movie was when you really look back at it you know like it's it's kind of shocking now i know um you know west craven was a known entity at this point he did the hills have eyes and stuff like that um sure. but this was really his first big one and he later did scream and all that yeah. which i actually think is a better movie than nightmare on elm street for sure and so yeah i think that there's a ton to talk about here because we got a lot of interesting inquiries from the audience about this this does seem to be a really beloved movie it obviously clearly is it doesn't not seem to be freddie is an iconic character which it's again i find questionable and um <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I have a lot to say. I, I, I feel more negative about the film than I thought I was going to going into it. I have no problem that I watched it, but I think some of my critiques will make a lot of sense when I get into them. Let me throw it over to you, though, and, and see how you feel about A Nightmare on Elm Street. Well, this was a fun one that you called this one. And early on, I have to be honest with you, I wasn't sure if I saw this movie. Now, of course, this would be the film that went on to spawn an iconic franchise, an iconic character. Everybody knows the lore. Everybody knows the series. But I wasn't sure if I saw this first movie. And you know what? I never did. I sat down to watch it and I was like, I have never seen this first film. Uh, so my, I remember going to see Dream Warriors, which was Nightmare 3, in the theater that was 87 or 88. I forget. I think it was 87. And that's where actually my experience with Nightmare, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street probably started. Probably saw it number two as well. I think that was Reven uh, Freddy's Revenge or Revenge, Revenge of Freddy or whatever. But I had never seen this first film. I had only, and it's it's so weird to, you know, you were saying now going back as we often do on the show, giving this film and this series like the litmus test in, you know, going back and looking at this, this thing uh, relevant to today and how does it hold up? So it was fun for me to actually go in and watch something that I hadn't yet seen. I completely missed this first film. And that goes to show you too, when something becomes, you know, an iconic franchise, you kind of lose track. Especially I was 10 going on 11 when this came out. I would be 11 that year. And of course you hadn't seen it as you mentioned in the theater. And I think it came out on cable and VHS the very next year in 80. So by 85, it was already on available for everybody to see at home. But and I'm sure HBO and, and Showtime are running it like crazy. But it was fun to actually do a topic where I haven't seen the actual film before. And it does leave, I agree with you, it's a, it's a suspect one in as far as it, how well it holds up. And also to talk about an icon, you know, an iconographic film director in Wes Craven 
and an iconic character in Freddy Krueger, of course, the 80s horror, you have that classic triumvirate, right? You have Jason Voorhees, Friday the 13th. You have Michael Myers of Halloween. And you have Freddy of Nightmare. So it, it's a great part of the 1980s horror conversation. And I think there is a lot to say about this film, about this period of time, about this particular character. How well does he hold up when you hold him against the other classic, iconic 80s horror villains, even a guy like Leatherface. Like, how does how does Freddy fit into all that? And um, yeah, Wes Craven is an interesting guy too to talk about. Like, you know, of course, I always delve into the directors when I'm researching, and I found out so many interesting things about this guy. You know, coming off of The Hills Have Eyes and Last House on the Left, which I really want to see because that was a very controversial film that I also missed. And I think Swamp Thing before this, but this is really the series that put him on the map. Very inventive idea. And as you said, Kyle, Scream, later on Scream, another thing kind of anchored or sort of hanging on a very classic, very iconographic, um, memorable concept. Very much like like Nightmare. But yeah, man, this is a great... And, and going into Halloween, going into the fall kind of feels right. And uh, I really enjoyed... Like, I really enjoy them. We talk about this so much in our conversations with classic films, thirty going back 30, 25, 30 years. Is that, you know, this is a film hung on practical effects in camera, maybe a little green screen and stunts and just being inventive for showing the imagery that you want to show on the film. So that was a fun part of the conversation for me, too. So we could start this and and the acting, you know, we got to talk about the actors. too. Definitely. So that, you know, there's so many different ways we could take this. And I'm looking forward to the talk, including a young Johnny Depp. Oh, my goodness. But yeah, Michael Maniage wrote into us on Patreon. And remember, you can support us on Patreon to also get your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas onto the show. He says, hello, Dagan's Dream Warriors. Did you know that the premise of the film is derived from a true story? Wes Craven read an article about a 1970s Cambodian refugee family that escaped Pol Pot's killing fields. Despite being safe, their son kept dreaming that someone was trying to kill him. He was afraid to fall asleep. After the boy finally succumbed to the slumber, the family awoke to his screams only to find him dead. Where do you stand on the idea that dreams have greater power than we know? Have you experienced dreams eerily coming true in your own lives? I did want to start here because it is interesting. I think the reason that I went to this movie subconsciously was because I've been for some years now really into reading and researching sleep. And I think I might have talked about this before. Sleep is I listen to a lot of like what you might call like academic or intellectual podcasts. As I think people know that's pretty much the only podcast I listen to. Uh, and I, I just play video games and just listen to these like lectures and debates and whatever the case might be and uh sleep i i search out a lot of stuff on sleep because and i don't know if people know this but sleep is a great mystery and when i was i was remarking to micah when we were watching a nightmare on elm street because there is a shot where she's you know the main characters in a sleep clinic and the way they're describing sleep i'm like it's actually nothing's really changed they're, they're talking about the different waves and how you you know, beta waves and and going into REM and all, all of these different things. And I'm like, we still understand that, but we don't really know why we sleep, what happens and what dreams are. And there's a lot, there are a lot of theories, but there are really no answers. And anyone who re- like listens to a lot of this stuff knows that there are just a lot of ideas. But the startling thing about dreams and sleeping is that everything sleeps and everything that at least has some sort of consciousness seems to dream. And so it seems to have some sort of really primordial, basic function, very like from the common ancestor, right? Like going that far back, perhaps. And I'm totally fascinated by it. So I think that it makes a lot of sense that I came to Nightmare on Elm Street subconsciously because I'm always thinking about that stuff. And I even recently started a dream book, which I've, I've barely gotten to write and I've only written three entries so far over about a month. Because I leave it up just a book next to my bed and I'm trying to record dreams that I remember. But I really only remember because when you're in like deep sleep and like, yeah, typically towards when you're waking up is when you're like towards the end of the night is when you're starting to really dream. And so I'm trying to remember those, but it's hard to do just to kind of see what it because I have definitely trends in my own dreams and stuff like that as well. That's fascinating. Uh, like That's awesome lots of repeatable trends and and things like that. And um it's interesting, you know, the, the whole idea about how like it seems like your mind needs to do this. It might be working problems out that like you forget about them because you need to untether them from reality so that you sure. don't get confused. Like there's all these sure. 
like because you know the, the more you think about a dream the more you forget it it seems like there's some sort of biological thing there where it's like you aren't supposed to remember this like just to let it go it's we're trying to make sense of data and put you know it's like when you put a when you're fighting a tough boss it just happened to me the other day i was t- fighting a tough boss in a game i was playing went to bed woke up destroyed it right the next day it happens right. all over i do it all the time i do that constantly it's so predictable that i do it i don't even get annoyed at games anymore i'm like oh, i'll just come back to this tomorrow and then i do and then it's just for some reason my mind has worked it out yeah so right. no absolutely so what is your um what is your, you know to michael's question here first of all did you know that it was inspired by a real story and also do you think that dreams have a greater power? Are you interested in sleep and and all of that stuff and what it means? Because I, I I don't know. I just find it a very interesting pursuit because there is so much mystery. It's like what we say about deep space or or the the depths of the ocean. Like we just don't know anything. And I find that personally quite appealing. Absolutely, it's fascinating. And what a great concept to hang a story on for a film. Definitely, I mean, you, you're you're already in. You know? Which is why it's so annoying that this movie's not very good. But I'll, yeah, I'll, absolutely, I'll, they kind of squandered the opportunity. You know, definitely. Yeah, so much that we don't know about this particular area of humanity. So much as of yet still unanswered questions and undecipherable. You know everything about it. You know, despite tons and probably billions of dollars worth of research and so many unanswered questions still. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. The true story that it's based on is fascinating. This immigrant family. And this young boy that's afflicted with these nightmares that he was sort of apparently, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the dad of this Cambodian family was actually a doctor. And s- sort of that um, pessimism or, or not believing him, which is, I think, part of the horror of this whole idea of this young people and the, the adults are just not, you know, the adults, there's some PTSD and some responsibility going on that the, the adults are actually culpable but also just kind of trying to poo-poo it. It's part of the horror, I think, for kids and part of what made it scary as a young person. But with this true story, it was actually really fascinating if you delve into it because they had him on sleeping pills, which he never took. He would hide them. The kid actually had, and you see this in the film with the, uh, you know, later on in I think the second half of the film, the kid actually had a Mr. Coffee Pot hidden in his closet. Like the kid was desperate. He was horrified and terrified of what was happening to him when he fell asleep and he was desperate to stay awake. And when he passed, you know, again, this was a child, this was a young guy with no apparent health concerns or anything like that. Something happened to him where he was apparently, you know, died in his sleep. Was he murdered in his sleep? What happened? What was he afraid of? There's so many unanswered questions there, but such a terrifying situation to find all these undigested you know, hidden sleeping pills in his closet and the Mr. Coffee machine and what happened. And then apparently that was sort of a domino effect of three or four more instances of that happening in that same, I guess, region within a year, which was really another strange kind of follow up to that story. And then also Wes Craven tells a story about what inspired him too. Like he was a young guy growing up in Ohio, very traditional, strict, super strict uh, Baptist family that he came from. He tells a story that he hadn't seen a film. He didn't see his first movie until he was a senior in college. That's how <laughs> sort of overprotective and everything this family was, except That's for wild. Disney films, he says, which oh, is okay. crazy, right? So you all that stuff, all that pent up sort of horror and violence and all that stuff, you could see why Wes Craven kind of became who he was, right? It was a catharsis. Imagine being I, such an auteur too that you can just make films having no basis for yeah <laughs> or having to catch up in that yeah. short amount of time it just doesn't you know? seem like something that people usually do it's like your formidable years usually just create what you do so imagine right. you being an artist where you hadn't even seen that's a great anything point until you were 22 yeah there was no real journey right like it's the journey kind of started in horror and i know he ch- he sort of tried to escape from horror but i think he was a natural for horror because of his his background but um Yeah. And he talks about a story when he was a kid, he heard this muttering in the street one random night, he got out of bed and he looked out, you know, under the streetlight and there was a guy with like the Freddy Kruegerish hat and a trench coat just standing in the street. And he said, when he came to the window as this little guy, he, the guy looked up at him, like he sensed that he was being watched and he had such a malevolent face. The guy was like, he looked like he could do harm, you know? Mm -hmm. And he made this like, you know, boo type of expression before walking away, like to scare the, 
Wes as a as this young kid, and that stayed with him. And I love hearing stories like that because if you you know you could see some of that in the movie, you could see some of that in what they imparted with Freddy. But I think it is. I think Nightmare on Elm Street really horrified me as a kid, even though I started it probably as an early teen. Now I was already. If you guys are avid followers of the of Knockback, you already know that I was terrifying myself with things. My um. Poltergeist was one that I scared myself with. And then a little bit later, Aliens was another one that I really wasn't ready for. I really didn't have the I really didn't have the personality to wade through those type of things as a young kid. I was way too sensitive, but I would torture myself with them. This wasn't one of them. But the idea scared me even in my mid-teens where, and it's so clever, right? Every neighborhood has an Elm Street. So it's sort of saying like this could apply to anybody. And also not just a killer who is intentionally harming children, which is horrifying in itself, but also taking advantage of you and pursuing you when you're at your most vulnerable and sort of taking advantage of preying on somebody when they have to do a normal human function, like go to sleep. And it's not like, it's, it's weird. It's not like a thing where you could just like in horror, you could kind of circle it like, okay, I'll avoid the haunted house or I'll go out with a gun or I'll get the police for help. This is like, you know, when you're asleep, it's just you and there's no defending yourself. There's no, there's nobody else that could help you. You're at really your most vulnerable. So that whole idea was really scary. And I think that helps the film because I'm not sure on his own how scary Freddy is, at least in this film. I remember him going on to being a little more frightening of a character as they evolve him through the franchise. But for this film, he's almost like a satanic Bugs Bunny or something. Yeah, like he's very weird. Goofy and cartoony Definitely. compared to the other. And you know, he's slight of build. He doesn't have that imposing figure of like a Jason Voorhees or a Michael Myers or a Leatherface. You know, those are big hulking monster like characters that are much more threatening physically. You know, so He's this guy, this little guy's like, he, he's actually tiny. I mean, Robert Englund is a small dude and they don't play that down in the film. Like even against these teenage girls, like he's wrestling around with them. Maybe he's got the upper hand. Maybe they do. <laughs> like, I'm not sure how threatening that is. And it, it right. makes for a fascinating conversation of how scary it still is because most things, I'm such a wimp and a coward and so sensitive that most things that scared me when I was a kid still have the same degree of scaring power on me on my psyche they stay with me but nightmare freddy doesn't have that for me he became much less threatening now as an adult and this movie just brings that to the forefront you definitely know? definitely i love what you brought up about the um the elm street thing too because i was thinking about specifically the first season twilight zone episode the monsters are due on maple street where it had a, a which is an awesome iconic episode where the, the aliens basically get the humans to turn on each other um and just kill themselves so that they don't have to do anything and uh by like shutting off their engines and fucking with their technology it's a really amazing so good story it's also like 60 years old which makes it even more amazing but uh it reminded me of that where i feel like that was a, a similar thing where it's like oh maple street we all have a maple street and actually we got a, a letter about this because i thought um that this was fairly interesting lou and ray loper wrote into us and said this one stuck with us as children as adults my sister actually bought a house on elm street and it even has a furnace downstairs she has oh. yet to be taken in a nightmare, but I did have one of those hard sweaters as a child, so I'm sure this all can't be a coincidence. <laughs> I I do love the idea of of like I would like to go look. I didn't look. You would have to kind of go into Lexus Nexus and do a little bit of research, but it would be interesting. Did this movie have any ill effect on real estate on Elm Streets? This movie was such a phenomenon that it would be interesting to know. Like, did did someone be like, "Oh, this is my dream house," but it's you know 17 Elm Street? Bye. Like that kind of thing, because uh, you, you want like, I wonder that that's when I hear Elm Street. I mean, that's all I'm ever going to think about is this movie. Everyone pre 1984. That wasn't even a thing, which also makes me wonder, like, do people still name streets Elm Street? That's a that's great a, that's, question. That's another thing, right? That right. is a fantastic way. I, I could tell you this. When I was a kid, I was really happy that grandma lived on Willow and not Elm. Yeah, sure. There was an Elm in that neighborhood. There was, you know, I was so relieved about that. Yeah, you're <laughs> so not going to have any no on nightmares Street. on Willow, but <laughs> Willow is a, a lovely tree as well, but I feel like you're right about Freddy. And this is where I didn't, this is where the movie kind of fell apart for me because I'm like, this isn't scary at all. Like 
I think of Jason. Well, I I think Jason and Friday. The, first of all, Friday the Thirteenth is another one of those. I love that movie, and it's an, one of those movies so that I just keep putting off because I'm like, well, I'll never do Friday the Thirteenth because that's an awesome story. That story has everything that's necessary, I think, for really compelling horror for the most part, which is like, you know, teens, yeah, picked on child, death, fucked up mom, camp, the woods. Like the the hockey mask, Absolutely. the imposing figure. Like Jason's awesome. I've always been a huge fan of Jason. Like I've always loved Jason. And Michael Myers is really similar. Someone had actually written in about Michael Myers. I don't think we used it, but them saying like he's just a man who's not going to stop coming after you. That that, that the very famous machine. like yeah, exactly. It's like Freddy's like nowhere in this conversation for me. And it's interesting because. I, I again, I want to go back because I don't want to be negative. First of all, I don't think it's a bad movie at all. But what frustrates me about it is that, uh, you know, watching it, all I could think about was, wow, this could be so much better. How did they not see sure. how many ways this movie could have been better? And that was what was frustrating to me. The movie moves way too fast and probably is one of those movies that needs to be longer. They don't establish reality at all. I think that that might be part of it. Because you don't really know what's real and what's not, including towards the end. And we'll obviously talk about that in a little while. That's true. Yeah. So I don't know if that ethereal kind of thing is is intentional or not. But I'm like, wait a minute. Who are these people? What is their real life like? What is the relationship like? Why are we spending just one 10 second scene on the, the white, you know, the mom and her boyfriend? Why are we only spending a little bit with the four kids walking in the school? Like, let's establish reality. Yeah. And also get a little bit more into what the parents did. Yes. And that's definitely that should be like half of the movie is the parents really like looking at each other in every scene being like, oh, fuck, you know, and everyone kind of being in on it. That's what frustrated me was I was like, it should have a larger cast. And uh, I mean, these these movies require ensembles, in my opinion. and. In, in most ways. I mean, think about the camp counselors, right? In Friday yeah. the 13th and all that. Like, you need some ar- bigger array of players. And then it's like, okay, these kids all live on this street. There was this court case and this 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 murderer and, and child molester got away. And the parents did something about it. So, like, really play that up. Like, m- make the glances more knowing. And Absolutely. drag out the psychology of it a little bit more. And... Maybe make it so that the parents are guilty. Explain the alcoholism a little bit more. Explain the, the divorce maybe a little bit more or the the cop kind of knowing but being flipping and telling, you know. So I was just kind of frustrated because I hadn't seen the movie in a long time and I never really looked at it through a critical eye. And there's a lot of really cool scenes in it, especially like the death scenes I think are amazing. Oh, but they're, they're great. But I, I feel like I'm like, well, why did you do it this way? You almost did it in maybe the worst way and that's what frustrated me the most and i i don't remember too much about the second and third ones i've seen them but i don't know if they get more into into that but they should have it's it's what makes it's what makes it interesting like imagine watching the shining and having like nothing in the in the second half of the film at all to explain like any of the madness it just kind of oh it's just everyone kind of knows the madness is so (laughs) what do you what do you think about my critique, my general critique? Oh, I think that's, I think you're absolutely on point with that. I think that for as fun and entertaining as a movie this is and looking back in it and how 80s it is, it's a, it's a lot of fun to watch and it's a quick watch, but there are a lot of missed opportunities. Some of it feels kind of disjointed, like it's kind of an assemblage of disparate parts, but I think the engine of what makes the story so cool is that there is a dark cloud hanging over this town. You know, there's some sort of trauma, some sort of past PTSD that this whole generation, the parents of the teenagers are kind of trying to suppress and trying to bury the reality that when this killer, when this child killer or pedophile, as it was in the script, which they try to sort of walk back, I think in the film, but they might bring that back to light in the subsequent, um, sequels. And, and what's interesting, by the way, is Amazon Prime describes him as a pedophile. In the yeah, because and I think, you know, I think in 84, they tried to walk that back. But as soon as the censors started to relinquish 
power and 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 the film studios got a little more um wiggle room that new line and Wes Craven and the powers that be were able to kind of inject that into the story a little more. And you see it with Freddy. I mean, look at the bathtub scene, right? I mean, he's going after teenage girls, right? You know, so, but I think that that really was a missed opportunity. You should really see the parents trying. There's some sort of accord in the town where the parents are in on something that the kids don't know about, but it's that, you know, that darkness, that past, that dark past that they're trying to bury is affecting their children. Right. And I thought you would see that, like, for instance, with Johnny Depp's parents in the film, where they have this sort of, um, they have this sort of nonverbal agreement where it's like a, a nod and a wink, like, all right, like, this is coming to light because of the sins of our past. But you will really only see that with the main character's parents. And I would say even more so just with the mom character. She's really the only one that seems haunted by it you know she's got freddie's claw wrapped up in the furnace and everything like that so that's really kind of an interesting missed opportunity for the film that i think they could have really you know that's part of the lore too that's another thing that's interesting about this is that a nightmare on elm street as a franchise is so well known it's so it's such a huge part of pop culture now that we already know the story behind freddie that he was a child molester that he was a child murderer and the parents he got off on some sort of legal technicality and the parents in this place exacted revenge and murdered him and then he's coming back in some supernatural way to exact vengeance on these families right and i think going into this blind like let's say you didn't you were living under a rock somewhere and you didn't know the story the overarching story of a nightmare on elm street you could go into this story it'd actually be pretty good first half because you don't really know and as those those secrets and the the origins and the reasons why these things are happening or revealing themselves, I think it could be pretty cool. But as our generations were kind of deprived of that, like mm. even going into this film now, I knew that or I already knew the lore of Freddy for years. I've never even seen this film, for instance. That's a great case in point. So, and I think it's also fair to say, Kyle, that this movie starts out, I think, on the right footing. It could be pretty scary. It, it sort of meanders into ridiculousness and absurdity territory. And then I think for the ending, the last couple of minutes, it kind of meanders back into like scary territory again, which is an interesting journey to take over the course of Definitely. the film. But Definitely. yeah, I mean, starting there, I think this movie already has an advantage for Freddy because the idea, and I know how haunted I was as a kid of this idea of like falling asleep at night, you're fucked. There's no parents to help you. There's no cops. There's no weapons. You're in this dream place where this person you know, this mysterical, mysterious entity, this mystical being, malevolent being has power over it and you're fucked when you go to sleep. And I remember feeling that as a kid, like being, I don't think it ever did keep me up through the night, but I remember falling asleep on plenty of nights being like, oh shit, Freddy, you know what I mean? Even last night going to sleep, I was like, oh man, dreams are fucked. Like who knows what's going to happen tonight, you know? And then right. you just fall asleep. I just, and this this goes into, I think for me, the the major frustration I have with the film, which is just, it's awesome. It's an awesome idea. Like, how do you I don't want to say bungled it. I don't think that's true. This movie is beloved. I like I have to accept that I am in the minority. I mean, even at the time, this movie was beloved. It wasn't like just something that people wanted to go see. It was people were going to see because it, it had great word of mouth and obviously got um, higher budget sequels that were also beloved and all the rest. So at least two that were beloved. So I just don't know how you come up with this idea and don't know how to better execute on it. And who am I to, who am I to say like, I'm not Wes Craven, but, and I have the, also the ability of hindsight and most of the horror genre has come out since this movie has been made. So you have to kind of look at it through those lenses as well. Like they were all kind of pioneering things, but there was some true real horror going on at this time um, from alien to the thing. And this movie true. is not even remotely in that conversation for me, not to mention Halloween in the late seventies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is a fucking awesome film. Oh, and so all, good. And all of the rest, the original, the remake's fine too, but I just, I get frustrated because I can just see in my mind the way this could have gone. And it's funny because you almost see the lack of establishment is played out again in, in Scream because Scream famously opens up with the Drew Barrymore scene, right? Did we ever do Scream? We did no, Scream, didn't we? No, we haven't oh, done no, we, it yet. But like, you know, it starts out with Drew Barrymore, like a 15 minute scene with just Drew Barrymore, right? And 
classic. And the murder. It's a classic intro. Classic. But what's awesome about it is that then they get out of that and establish what's going on. The reason yeah. that Scream and later I always know I, or I knew you did last summer and all of that, which is, I think, another good late 90s horror flick. They have something in that they establish the characters more and by playing up the sex or by playing up the drugs or by playing up whatever these debauched kids do in the, a lot of these various movies. It makes it more interesting and exciting. And I guess I just didn't really have I didn't have a, I, I guess what frustrates me is I, I never had a grasp of what Nancy's real world was like. So how do there's just nothing about that. They walk into school. The problems are already kind of starting to happen. They're already sharing their talks about their nightmares. Like, why are we starting from there? Why don't we start where they have a normal day? They all go home. Maybe they're they're doing all their different things. Then they all go to bed at night and all have these nightmares. Then they get yes. back together the next day and talk about it. Maybe some of them are skeptical. Some of them aren't. Some of them are more, more scared than not. And then maybe one of them describes the nightmare, why they're so worried to one of their parents. The parents are like, who like asks you know asks them to describe the character and they realize it's Freddy Krueger so maybe there's this other arc that the kid that's happening beyond the kids where the parents are now talking to each other and being like something's up like remember what we did in 1976 or whatever and got away with like there's just that's what's frustrating like why why didn't you do it like that <laughs> yeah know? and I guess I guess who am I to say but I I just it and it, they don't do Freddy any favors by not establishing it more. I think he's a really, truly goofy character. In fact, there's that that one scene where I'm like, I don't know if this is supposed to, is this supposed to be funny? Which where one? It's like one of the first times you see him with the long arms yeah, where he's like, marionette which, arms, which is yeah. cool. I like that. But then he runs like, you know, like at her. And I'm like, is this supposed to be funny? This isn't. <laughs> it's such a cool idea. A guy with like the just one like one glove on not two with the knives on the hands he made this thing himself it's it's fucking awesome like right. why it's not a hatchet it's not a butcher knife it's a, right you know it's something it's a, different something unique it's, it's you know? dope i guess something he made for himself and so i don't know i think that that's kind of what frustrates me because yeah the idea of like don't fall asleep don't you know don't and actually on the other end nancy's yeah. bravery and being like i'm bringing this motherfucker out of the dream it's a very cool idea. She's a great like, character. Like, wake me up and I will bring him out of the dream. Like, everything, the whole premise, I can imagine the elevator pitch being like, oh, yeah. Yeah, sounds amazing on paper. And, Absolutely. And I, and I think that they were still happy with it, obviously. I mean, but I don't know. I just think this movie could have been so much more. This could be like a Rosemary's Baby shining. Sure. The thing, like, type pantheon film. And I know that people think about it from its cultural relevance sure yeah. but it's not yeah. i i don't know how anyone can say like this is a great horror movie i mean that that's my personal opinion like i i just i feel like it's just such a squandered opportunity it's a difficult conversation because it goes on to spawn a franchise that becomes iconic but it is interesting a lot of what you're saying because a lot of these choices were made before they knew they were going to have any maneuverability or power to make this to make sequels and to make this into a franchise and to make this into an MTV crossover type, you know, it did what other horror movies didn't do that. It really crossed over into pop culture. Unlike what, you know, Friday the 13th is fabled and celebrated, especially by horror people and filmic type uh, advocates and, and connoisseurs. But, and the same thing with, with uh, Texas Chainsaw and the same thing, of course, with, the Halloween films, but what the Nightmare did was cross over into MTV. It took, and I think it probably attempted to do something different, which I give it a lot of credit for. It took, it made um, an antagonist, a killer in the film, and it flew in the face of what came before. You know, like look at Jason Voorhees, look at Michael Myers. They're kind of like these brooding, mute, shadowy. Um, don't really know exactly what their motivations are. They're just kind of these voiceless, perpetual, hulking, kill it, tr more traditional killing machines, you know, chainsaws, knives, hatchets, that sort of thing. What they did with Freddy is they said, let's create a character that's a little more cartoony that seems to be really enjoying what he's doing. He's really relishing the horror that he's bringing on these people and the violence that he's you know, the violence that he's bringing to this town, to these kids, to these families. 
in a cartoony way, in a sick way. Now it's the same type of thing. Demented, yes. Psychopathic, yes. But much more animated. And I could see what they were trying to do with Freddy, and also with an iconic look with the hat and the sweater, which is a little a little strange. The physique, sort of this little guy who looks like a little leprechaun type guy, but that iconic giant clawed weapon on his hand you know something different something that kind of flew in the face of everything that came before really unique a great launching point to create a horror villain you know and i think where freddy is the most successful you see it a little bit in this film and i think in subsequent versions and hopefully we'll be able to talk about the next film and the, the next sequels on the show at some point but is not in the physicality like i know robert england says like he knows what he looks like. He knows what his build is. He knows he's like a 145 year old, 145 pound, five, five dude. So what could he do? So he was kind of, um, uh, imparting like James Cagney and Klaus Kinski's Nosferatu and sort of the stance and sort of the way he moved. If, if he can't be big and hulking and threatening physically, maybe he could do that through his movements, through, through inspiration from classic horror and stuff like that. But I think with Freddy, where he's the most frightening is not the physicality, not the claw, not in chasing girls down and tackling them and then them overpowering him and stuff like that (laughs) while he's making jokes. And I love the fact that he makes jokes and quips and one-liners. And again, he really seems to be enjoying being that, you know, being so malevolent. I like that because it's so different than a lot of the classic horror that came before. But I think where he's scariest in it is in his manipulation and his sort of magic and his supernatural seemingly abilities of controlling dreams. We'll see that later on with like he takes somebody what they love, like their love of video games and uses that horror against them. You know, he's taking somebody's arteries out and using them as a marionette with their own veins, like shit like that. That's scary because, again, he seems to have power in this dream world. Well, obviously we don't, we're just victims in that place. And I think that's where it goes on. And we see that in the end a little bit with the car, with the Freddy stripes on the car that maybe they're still trapped in a dream and now they're kind of beholden to him being trapped in this car and they're driving away. That's where Freddy's scary because his powers transcend anything that we saw in a movie villain up to this point. You know, he seems to have power over dreams that's Dreams, as you said, it's already super frightening. It's already mysterious. We have no idea what's going on when we go to we have no idea what we're in for when we go to sleep. Now we're dealing with Freddy on top of that. You know, so again, that concept, super, super frightening. Now, if he was a little more frightening and a little more menacing, I guess, then that would have only played up the idea. But I think they do do a better job with him and they learn how to use him better in the subsequent sequels, I think. Yeah, he's well, let me get let me get this out here from Camza 115 wrote into us on Patreon it says, hey, Super Moriarty bros. So glad you guys are doing Elm Street as a topic. It's one of the greats. Freddy Krueger is undoubtedly one of the most iconic and important slashers of all time. The red and green jumper, the glove of knives and Robert England's chilling yet charismatic performance all come to mind instantly when I hear his name. What do you two find is the most memorable thing about Freddy? What do you think it is about him specifically that has cemented his place as a horror icon for almost 40 years? Love the shows. Keep up the great work. I, one of the things I noticed about him in this film, and I actually think in this film generally, is that they they don't ever linger on any shot. So you can't really understand what exactly it is that. That's really true. Very makes, MTV style cutting. Even before yeah, like, that kicked in. They they really moved quick and you can never Definitely. really get a good look at Freddy and what makes him scary, which I actually think makes him even scarier. I think when the movie moves quickly like that, it, it becomes scarier. So I actually I like the small, like like you had brought up already, the unassuming nature of, well, let's not say unassuming, but the the lack of disposition that he has in situations um, with his small size and stature requires him to have something else. So for me, I mean, I, I do think the, the glove of knives is iconic. And of course, that is part of the icon. Like everyone has their own iconography. I think what's all the vil- like all the memorable villains. I think what's interesting about him, in my opinion, is that it might not be his face, but rather his weapon, as opposed to Jason's mask or I think even Michael Myers' mask as well. What do you find most memorable about this performance? And uh, I was surprised that um, that uh, with when it comes to Freddy, that Robert England was not the original person that was going to play him. 
which is surprising because we would have we may might have gotten a completely different well we would have gotten Absolutely. a completely different feel i think what, yeah robert yeah. england it's interesting for him because you know he really first of all i love listening to him because he really embraces he's one of those guys that really embraces being known for a character you know he's not he doesn't act above it or like he's too good he's really embraced being freddy and he's so good at it you know i think freddy the lighting and the terror he brings is only brought out by Robert Englund delighting in the fact of playing this character. And I know previously, like he was around for a while, like he was doing walk-ons and chips and Charlie's Angels. I mean, back in the day, like soap, like he w- he already was doing film and television like a decade prior to Nightmare. So he was popping around and he was, I think, frustrated, he says, because he was always playing like the nice guy or the second fiddle or the nebbish, you know, so to, to actually play like a horror villain, to actually play this like evil malevolent dude was actually really like, he really relished the opportunity. And I think what makes Freddy the most memorable, and again, if you put him shoulder to shoulder with the other horror icons or the other guys that are much more dour or serious, the other villains that we knew in the 80s, the other slashers, is that taunting and the cackling and the chasing and the sort of, you know, adding insult to injury by t- making fun of people and teasing them and trying to get the teenager's goat by like, you know, later on we'll see like him like making fun of their pimples and like making fun of their period and all that kind of stuff. Like, right, right. you know, the fact that he seems so connected to his prey and the fact that he's willing to have fun with them first, it's really kind of twisted and, and kind of cool. I think sometimes it works against him in the things they do in this film, like when Nancy Fine, you know, brings his hat out of the dream. She's clever enough to grab his hat and show the people in the dream clinic, like, look, like this is what's going on and sort of fighting against that skepticism and everything. But then he has his name written in his hat. What is he, fucking second grader with his lunchbox? <laughs> Why does Freddie have his name? written in his hat? Like that's not scary. That's weird. You know? So I think despite Robert England's best intentions and his efforts in this film, because he's really good in it, you know, and you're also dealing with, you already said like the pr- sometimes cheesier low budget for this film, obviously they would have much better new line budgets going forward, but you know, they were beholden to that million dollar low quality practical effect budget where they had to come up with the best solution given their resources and but I don't think that's Robert Englund's fault. I think he does an amazing job. He continues to do an amazing job. He made this iconic character. And also the claw. You know, again, the claw, the claw of knives. It's iconic, not just because it's a as a killing weapon, which is actually kind of a horrifying thing. Like you don't want to face that thing down, right? But also the way he uses it, nails on a chalkboard to make the, you know, make his prey miserable, make himself known. Um you know, torture them before he's even near them. Like that's all very like delicious stuff that I'm sure Robert Englund and Wes Craven came up with in order to make a really memorable type dude. And then when you look at his origins and you know, he's coming from this place of hurting kids and he's still at it in this, whatever ghostly occult supernatural form. It's super cool. It's super, super cool. You know, and, and I think very successful even in the film, even though the film sort of gyrates, with absurdity and and awkward moments and i think a lot of that's due to other stuff in the film it's not due to it's not due necessarily to freddie well let's talk to some of the other characters here we brought up nancy the protagonist uh, heather langenkamp now it's interesting i i didn't know this when i was reading about her i i never made this connection but i remember the show that she was on that um she was the main character of that growing pain spinoff yeah, just, just the, the ten, ten of us. Just the ten of us. Yeah, which yeah, I had yeah. never. I, I was like, "Where do I know you from?" And that's where I knew her from. Uh, so, obviously, other than this and the third one, I guess as well. What did you think about her characterization and her performance? I think she's she's probably the most int- really the be- be- best part of the film in some way. And uh, yeah, what, what do you think? I agree. So memorable. So eighties. It's interesting that you brought up just the ten of us, Kyle, because I was remembering her. I was looking forward to seeing her in this film, and of course kind of journey as I journeyed back to see if I actually have ever had ever seen this film, which I hadn't, but I was remembering her specifically as sort of like the prototype for like the cute nerd girl, which is a huge thing now, right? 
the cute nerd girl wears her dorkiness on her sleeve, huge glasses, YouTuber. It's, it's like a thing. And I'm down. Da- I'm down for like the cute nerd girl. I love the look. Think of like Vanessa from the first Austin Powers, that type of thing. Like the beautiful, like the the, the classic hot for teacher, like librarian look. And she was kind of like the prototype for that as a, you know, as a young guy, she was much older than me. I was like 10 or 11 going into this film and she was a, I guess she was a teenager playing this role. I remember her as like the first girl I recognized as that, you know, but I was really not thinking of her in this film. I was thinking her from just the 10 of us. And I think making a handful of appearances on Growing Pains first before the other sitcom spun off. Right. And that she was, she was like, I think the oldest daughter of a bunch of kids and she was sort of the straight laced and proper one the one with the, the head on her shoulders or the other ones were more ditzy or and wanted to go to the mall and all that kind of stuff and um she channels a little bit of that in the in this because she's responsible she's got a little more intelligence or a little more wherewithal than the other kids like she knows how to fight freddie she's got courage and yeah she's pretty good i think she's pretty good even as a young person in this film it had to be hard to like navigating back and forth between the small screen and the big screen because it's a it's it's two different sets of chops when you're doing a sitcom when you're doing a you know a a horror film for instance and i think she was really good i i think i really enjoyed her you know she had that sort of tiger beat thing going on like she was everywhere as a kid she was on bedroom posters she was on the the magazine racks at the supermarket you know along with the kurt camerons and the you know, Ralph Macchio's and everybody's and Johnny Depp's, of course. So yeah, I really enjoyed her. I really enjoyed her in this. I, th- I think she she sort of um, almost becomes as iconic as Freddy as the franchise goes, franchise moves forward too. Speaking of Johnny Depp, this is his first role as Glenn. And uh, it's so funny because he's so interesting in this. He, it doesn't even, you can see it's him, but it doesn't sound like him. Um, Maybe it just goes to show his range. He's only a few years away. I mean, obviously, he'll be in Platoon in a, in a smaller role in a couple of years after this. But Edward Scissorhands is, I think, six years after that. And then what's eating Gilbert Grape and so on and so forth. And so he becomes he becomes bigger from here. But really a very interesting first film for a young actor. And I think he does a pretty good job. I, li- I like him in this. And uh, I'm wondering what you think of his performance. It's so fun to go back and see a guy like this, an actor like this, who's a lot of people would argue is one of the best actors that ever lived. You know, he's that iconic and pre 21 Jump Street, pre before, you know, really launching. And I was looking at his performance. I was really analyzing it to see like, do I see like the Marlon Brando in there yet? Do I see the James Dean? And you really don't. It's it's actually kind of cool because you see a lot of that innocence. Like he doesn't have though that gravity yet you know he hasn't whatever method he went with or whatever he whoever he trained under or would go on to like um become so and so's protege or whatever you don't see any of that yet it's just a pure performance you know just it, it's as pedestrian as the next guy and i love seeing that because as you chart his projects you see that growth through tv and film but these are like the humble beginnings and i really don't see a lot of that sort of charisma or anything yet he's kind of like has that work a day type actor thing in this where he's just a young kid starting out and i think that's fun you know i think that's a lot of fun very sort of um prescient to in the opening credits to say introducing johnny depp like somebody saw they saw that this guy was going to be huge you know to say introducing johnny depp in the beginning of the thing is like you know, that's a, that's a forecast of things to come. And I don't know that I would have saw that as a casting director for sure. So kudos. Definitely. And I feel like, I don't know. I always love seeing the, an actor in an inauspicious sort of beginning as well, where you, you're almost surprised to see them in this place where Johnny Depp is much more known for, like you would never picture Johnny Depp doing a, a horror film today. Maybe he would. I don't know. But he's uh, pretty crazy. Yeah, he's, he's pretty right, crazy. Yeah. But he's more <laughs> into the weird, crazy. right? He's more weird now than. Yeah, than he's doing else. that turn where he's like very much. I think he left the country. His family's not, you know, and I'm not casting aspersions. Do what you want to do. That's totally fine, you know. But yeah, much more sort of, you know, wine ascot. He's in that. He's in that domain right now, you know. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> uh, 
All right, let's talk about the most memorable scenes. Ollie Reynolds wrote in and said, gentlemen, hope you're both doing well. I have incredibly fond memories of A Nightmare on Elm Street. I remember watching it as a young impressionable age, at a young impressionable age, and it's absolutely one of the most movie or movies that cemented my love for the horror genre. If you could pick one standout scene or image from the movie, what would it be? For me, it's the image of Freddy casually slicing his own fingers off while laughing maniacally. It displayed Freddy's absurdist sense of humor while still retaining a deep sense of terror. Keep up the great work, guys. To me, it's the the, the really the three death scenes are exceptional or not three. I guess two death scenes plus the almost death scene in the bath. So the scene, uh, I guess, kind of towards the beginning of the film when uh, what, who is it? What's her name? Tina, Amanda Tina. Weiss's character. She is killed. She's kind of like pl- plastered all over the wall. And so like that really cool scene. And I love the scene. And I think maybe my favorite scene would be the, the bathtub scene again, because it does suggest sexuality as he's like grabbing, like grabbing towards her vagina, basically. And then like kind of brings it back down and then sucks her in. And there's these really great shots of her like falling into the water. I really, really right. love that. I think they did a not really nice shot with that. And then, uh, the uh, well, the hanging scene, I guess uh, you could call that uh, that is a death scene. You could, I mean, that's that's neither here nor there as well. But I, I do enjoy, I guess, seeing the dream world exposed in the real world, as it were, and how that plays between these spaces. Like watching Johnny Depp famously get sucked into the bed is just awesome. It's just an awesome scene, and it's spitting out all the blood, and it's wild. What scenes stick out to you? You know, it's funny about the hanging scene with the kid in the, in the prison cell, because as it would go on in the franchise, that becomes such an innocuous Freddy murder. You know, it's very tame. It even occurred to me when I was watching, it was like, that's not as animated or cartoony as hor- or as horrific as Freddy will go on to be capable of. It's a very tame murder. So it's interesting that you brought that one up. It really, it kind of, it kind of um, stood out to me. I like, there's a couple of things I like. I can't escape that image of Freddy, beca- you know, as sort of a satanic or demented Bugs Bunny character. Like, almost, like, almost like a ball buster, like Bugs Bunny is like, Mwah! and then running, like give, right, giving right. the villain a kiss and then running away. Like he has that sort of thing going on. To, and I enjoy that in the performance. But I think the first probably third of the film where I think it's still pretty scary, there's some really great imagery. You mentioned the murder, the Tina kill. With, a, with the spinning room. I think that's really great. And I think it's very inventive how they you know, pulled that one off. But one that stays with me and that kind of scared me while I was watching it, very creepy, was Tina showing up at school in the body bag and then being dragged along the hallway with, and leaving the trail of blood. And then Freddy disguised at the hall monitor, busting um, Nancy's chops or whatever. But that whole body bag with the trail of blood imagery I think if the movie kept that tone, it would have been very scary. I think it ends on that tone in the last 30 seconds. But there's something very scary and creepy about that imagery that, that she's being pulled along, but we, there's nothing pulling her along. And, you know, and it, again, the imagery of a dead kid, which this movie pulls no punches with. You know, I think about, I'm watching Stranger Things with Graydon right now, and we just got past the barb. No spoiler alert, guys. If you haven't seen Stranger Things, I'll give you a second. The ba- the Barb murder, which definitely harkens back to Nightmare and the other the other films that we witnessed in the eighties, Poltergeist, where kids are getting fucked with. You know what I mean? There's no there's no and there's no. I think there were a lot of rules and regulations against that in Hollywood prior to the seventies. So this was a relatively new thing where you could see that on screen, and I think. That sort of idea holds up, and I think the first third to half a nightmare really holds that down, where they have that imagery. And again, like and again, they do it at the end with the Johnny Depp scene with the blood flying through the bed and hidden in the ceiling, and then the forensics guys are throwing up in the bathroom. Like that's really memorable shit. When you're a kid, it's like, and you know what? Also, I gotta say, Kyle, I gotta second you on the bathtub thing too. And again, why that's so scary, it's like that's supposed to be another place of relaxation and privacy, like the bed, like sleeping. So now he's fucking with you in the bathtub too. Like that's, this guy knows no bounds. Like he's going to fuck with you everywhere. Like there's no, 
there's no escape from this dude. And I love that. I love that the scene sort of, the bathtub scene sort of intimates that. And also the fact that, again, like the rapey sort of harming young people, young teenage girl thing, like that's where it's pretty scary. And I think in a 1984 context too, where this is a relatively new thing, like movies were just starting to do this, like Sam Peckinpah and stuff like that were just starting to do this in the early 70s to mid 70s. So this wasn't a this wasn't a thing that people were generally used to seeing yet. So take this back 35, 40 years ago. It's pretty, pretty frightening stuff. Definitely. You know? Definitely. Yeah, very well put. I'm wondering. Um, well, I don't want to go to the ending yet, actually. I do want to talk about a couple other things. I have my notes here and then we'll talk about the ending. Was it me or was there a serious Kevin McAllister type situation going on in this movie? <laughs> like where she was like, set. I found that whole thing where there's just they're at the bridge eating and she's reading yes. literally like a booby trap survivalist book. And then that seemed like that they just needed to film that scene to justify why she's like she looks she looks like she's like in the Viet Cong or something like, you know, scraping shit it, like go, she has like shotgun <laughs> shells that she got somewhere scra- putting it in the, i'm like what the fuck is going on here so that yeah. way i found that really weird I don't, yeah she becomes like travis bickle she's like reading a pamphlet on improvised explosives and she's making claymores in the bit like what like what is hap the the brisk pace is one thing but then just flying in the face of all logic this movie definitely does that and i don't know i know craven has a very craven paradoxical thing going on where it's like you know i bought a lot of this parody a lot of it is you know um satire and all that kind of stuff but when you look at it as a cohesive film it's like wait all of a sudden like nancy's like some like ptsd vietnam vet and she's like, like firefly yeah like- <laughs> <laughs> very strange very strange choice uh, i wanted to also give a quick shout out to uh, a visual that I really liked, which I feel like might have been copied in Castlevania three in Castlevania three. There's an enemy that's on fire and it moves really slowly, like lumbers forward. It's like a body on fire and it leaves little footprints behind it. And I like that. I, when I, that scene of Freddie, like being on fire and leaving the footprints, I'm like, I wonder if they, they took it from that because it, I, I do like that um, scene as well. And I also just wanted to co- point out some of the goofiness you brought up the, like when she pulls out that coffee, that coffee machine from under a bed, I like, actually started laughing. I was like, this is hysterical. True but, story, though. But yeah, it seems like that was the inspiration for it, like you said earlier. So I'm wondering what you think of this. I just put this in my notes just to ask, do you think that there's an element of like sci-fi in this movie? This is like an almost horror sci-fi movie. Almost. It's actually got a lot more in line with, I think, Alien. Yeah. Than it does, or even The Thing, than I think it yes. does, um, you know, Friday the 13th or The Shining. Absolutely. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? I always think of Wes Craven. And in particular, John Carpenter in the same breath. I think they have a very same, a very similar calling card as far as the tone, as far as what they're saying, as far as the imagery and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it definitely does cross over into sci-fi. I love because Freddie, again, like you're because you're dealing with dreams in a Nolan-esque inception type way. Again, you're dealing with dreams. You're dealing with somebody who has some sort of supernatural power over dreams so what's the difference between this and let's say something like scanners right where it's like you're dealing with people with unnatural powers and freddie has that so he has there's a little more sci-fi to freddie than the average bear than the average slasher and the imagery too like you're saying the fire print the fire footprints on the carpet and the bisquick on the steps. That's something that I think was another missed opportunity for this. If you're trying to tell a story about people trapped against this killer who's pursuing them in their dreams, why not be beholden to those typical experiences that we have as everyday people in dreams where we can't run fast enough or you know the ground feels like quicksand? A uh, very similar thing to like the dream you have where you're embarrassed in your underwear. It's the same type of thing. Like call in those typical things that would make the experience really horrific. Like you're trying to get away, but the knife just disintegrates in your hand. Or you think you have a weapon, but then the knife disintegrates in your hand. Or 
you think someone's there to help you and they then they transform into a monster. That wasn't really played up enough. I think it 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 sort of tread in the territory where it got maybe a little too confusing on and a little too twisted up. And maybe that just speaks to my own stupidity. I don't know. But for me, like I wasn't really sure all the time when we were in a dream and when we weren't. Right. And it made it hard to kind of call the shots or try to put yourself in as an audience surrogate of like what what would I do here? But I think that would have made it scarier if we were kind of beholden to those dream rules, you know, where it's like you see a little bit of that, but it would have been cool to take it further. You know, definitely, definitely. Also, I, I just have to point out, and this was really noticeable as well, just how a movie like this really couldn't take place in the same way in the modern era. When you think about how they stymie um, even just their basic ability to communicate, like when Nancy is trying to talk to someone or trying to get, you know, communicate or dad or trying to talk to Glenn or trying to talk to her mom or trying to leave the house, you realize that they do some really kind of campy and fun things, I guess, to kind of limit her mobility, which is her mom's an alcoholic. They establish that right away. So she's going to like pass out. She gets all of these bars somehow put on the on the house so she can't leave. Then she passes out the keys. <laughs> nowhere to be found so then nancy's trapped in this thing she pulls the phone out of the wall so she has no other way to communicate with anyone it's just it's funny because there are it's it's unbelievable that this would even be able to happen today it would be unbelievable that would be able to happen at all but i I, it makes me sad that a lot of horror needs to set itself in rural areas or in the past or other things like that because it's just so easy to ruin the horror with the trappings of like, oh, I'll just go on the internet. Like yeah. a good example is like she has no idea who Fred Krueger is. She asks like several people and no one will tell her. She could just go on the internet and look up Fred Krueger, but no, she can't. Like she has no way of figuring that out. And so it's, it's there's a dearth of information that makes this movie function and a dearth, of course, of communicative abilities that makes the movie function where I feel like a lot of horror just doesn't work anymore because you have to like The Witch, which we really love. You have to go into the deep past. Or with uh, Midsummer, which is a movie I really love. Like You have to go into this middle of nowhere in a foreign country. And Until Dawn, a really wonderful horror video game where they're like in northern Canada and the phones don't work and stuff. There's, do you, did you notice that as well? Like that they didn't really have to do much to stop her? That it, it was pretty... How would, I know they remade it about 10 years ago and I haven't yeah. seen it, but I, I'd be interested to know how they get around all that. Yeah. Once it becomes a little more logical, and again, that that could be where again the missed opportunity of like you pull in the parents or the older generation in this town with the wink and the nod working together to try to make this thing or make this idea go away or make sure it's not revealed to their kids what happened. You know, that again, that inescapable dark cloud, but yet trying to get out from under it, but that it's inevitable. It's going to pursue you. And, you know, then it could have been everybody working together. Like Johnny Depp's parents were just annoyed. You know what I mean? Like they, they are parents in the town of the same age too, but there was no intimation that they had anything to do with it. But if Nancy's mom was telling the truth, then many of them would have been involved in that whole thing. It was just, it wasn't just her and just low rent, uh, Michael Ironside, the guy that, play, <laughs> the guy that plays her dad, which I thought was Michael Ironside until the end of the film. I was like, yeah. that's not Michael Ironside. Like he has an evil twin somewhere. This guy, also, I like, think, also, I think the, the, the mom puts on a kind of Shelly Duvall type <clears throat> oh, uh, performance here as well. Uh, right very lately. good point. Yeah. She acts like she's on ether. I mean, yeah. let's just call it what it is. Like, yeah. I know she's supposed to be in the bottle, but, that's not an alcoholic. That's somebody who's like, yeah, she was acting like she was like, I don't even know. Like it was too much whimsy. It was like, you're a little too asleep at the wheel. Like let's have a, let's have a proper performance here. It it only worked at the end when you were questioning whether it was a dream or not with the fog and the sunshine and her being on the porch all garbed in white or whatever. It's the only time her acting worked in the entire film because it was just like, you know, she was just acting like she was in this, dream state ironically which is which is actually really which is really funny you know what i love about what you said before with keeping your dream journal here's the idea for the film i love the idea of 
now you doing this because now you get to track like any sort of patterns or rhythms with your dreams. You could even draw up any connections to what's on your mind the night before, what's going on in real life. You could really see, you know, you could, I think that you, you'll be able to really see, maybe get to the bottom of some of the things and what's in your subconscious and what's sort of playing out on the peripheries, on the outer edges of your mind when you go to sleep at night or what's going on with your life that week or whatever. But this movie could have used a little more of that, I think, in, you know, making the dream state a fearful place. You know what I mean? Like, and not just because Freddie's in there, you know, making sort of dealing with and navigating the mysteries that we already deal with on a day to day on top of everything else. Now you're dealing with, with Freddie, I think. And I do think, and I don't want to misremember, but I do think they go on to do that with two, three, four, and so on, where they play that up a little more. And it's, it's a little more personal. It's drawn up with the kids that Freddie's after now, as far as like their own, each of their own individual lives, what they're into, their hobbies, their hangups, their fears, and all that kind of stuff. That's what this first movie could have used. And again, a little more of that tone, a little more of that dragging along the high school corridor and the body bag tone, you know, just kind of like creepy. Sure. Instead of just spelling everything out and making it a little too cartoony and then the whole thing at the end dude with like i understand the dad's like a police lieutenant and the parents are divorced it took me a little while to even realize the parents were divorced i thought they were just kind of like adversarial then i realized okay they're actually divorced the dad's not just not home at work he's like doesn't live there okay i get it but it gets really weird with the whole thing with johnny depp's you know <laughs> johnny De- there's a lot of this in the movie it's not just here but tell me if you agree with me. Johnny Depp is murdered viciously. Mm. Gallons of blood seeping through the, the ceiling into the first floor. Cops everywhere. Nancy knows what's going on. She's trapped in her house. She just goes to sleep. Her and her mom, and her mom goes to sleep. Like an hour later as the cops are leaving, the mom's just like, all right, I'm going to bed. Like, but, like it's just like <laughs> a lot of like, or even when Tina dies, that's Nancy's best friend. And it was just like, all right, like, you're drinking, like, you're going to go to school? Like, all right. Like, I guess so. Like, you know, don't drink too much coffee. Like, what? Like, her best friend was just murdered hor- horrifically, and the boyfriend's, like, on the lam because they think he did it with his switchblade. Like, it was like, there was no, there's, n- I could suspend my disbelief with the best of them. This movie really requires you to suspend a lot of disbelief just to have fun with it. You know what I mean? Like, there's, it's a bridge too far for suspending disbelief, this movie, you know? Well, it's that, still fun, still that go, fun, but that goes know. into the last question I wanted to ask from David Graham, who says, um, how do you interpret the end of the film? What is it reality or was it a mm, dream? Mm. Now, I think that this is somewhat answered because I think the, this protagonist comes back in the third one, right? So I don't know. I don't know. I'm not familiar enough moving forward, but I always assumed that it was, um, just a dream and that everything kind of went the way it was, but I don't really know. I'm not even really sure what the purpose of the end is. I find the, the end kind of strange. What, what, what is your interpretation of it? I mean, if we're beholden to Freddy rules, they must still be in a dream one, because I think Freddie was defeated a little too easily. You know, they're kind of, they're kind of wrestling on the, uh, again, like Freddie wrestling with the teenage girls. It's not a good look. Like, it's like maybe the, you know, pedestrian, normal teenage girl is going to get the upper hand. She's not even like a softball player or a wrestler, like tough teenage girl. She's like an average teenage girl. Like, and maybe Freddie's going to win and maybe, and he's got the claw. Like he's got, he should, he should have the upper hand on most teenage girls, especially with the weapon and everything like that. Certainly. But I think he's defeated a little too easily. And I think that he only, if Freddie only has powers in the dreams, which is, what we know so far at least before the sequels then they still have to be in a dream not only because it appears to be a dream with the fog and the mom being alive and everything but because they're whisked away whisked away in that freddy car it must be you know and then the mom's dragged through the window but the mom's already dead there's a great still of that scene of the mom (laughs) sort of like cpr dummy getting dragged through the window where you could see the fabric arm like all wrinkled it's sorry it's great (laughs) 
It's great <laughs> stuff. But I like the ending because the ending makes it scary again. Because by the ending, you're so annoyed. I think Johnny's Johnny Depp's parents were the ones that put me over the edge. I was like, these people are just too annoying. I can't, I can't buy anything that's happening, especially his dad. I was just like, I can't with that. So by the end, they kind of take it back into creepy and scary territory. So it's a proper, sets it up for a proper sequel too, which I like. And I like that the audacity of like having this very modestly budgeted film, a lot of question marks and going in and saying, this is going to be, you know, we're going to continue this. You know, like this is going to be continued. I like the I like the bravado of that. Sure. You know, because there's no way, there's no way in hell they knew they were going to be able to do that at this point. You know, so it it's kind of cool. neat. Definitely. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about, Dave, with Nightmare on Elm Street before we wrap it up? You know what? There was one thing that I noticed that I really enjoy about this film, and that's the movie poster. Did you see the image? It's an illustrated. I guess it's supposed to be an illustrated young teenage girl. I guess it's supposed to be the Nancy character and she's under the sheets and Freddie's, you know, claw knife claws hovering above her, but it's a beautiful illustration. And it just harkens back to that mid eighties era movie poster illustration time where it was like before they did too much with high gloss photo before they did too much with Photoshop. It's just a beautiful painting. And I, so I want to give a nod to uh, the illustrator, Matthew Joseph Peak. his name was. And apparently he did all of the, I believe he did all the Nightmare posters through five, I believe. So it's cool that they kept the same illustrator throughout. And again, just kind of like we know Drew Struzan with like the Indiana Jones imagery and the Star Wars movie posters and everything. But to, to have another guy, and there were a lot of, of professional commercial illustrators back then. But I love that period. Because it was part of the excitement of being a kid and maybe seeing this movie poster. Maybe we were seeing Ghostbusters or Karate Kid and we would see the movie poster for this. And it, how enticing that was, you know, just from a single image and how scary it could have been and how forbidden it seemed. And I think, you know, that promotional art was a big part of that for us growing up. And, um, you know, it was fun. It was fun to have this conversation. And it was really fun to review something that I actually hadn't seen. Yeah. Which you never really kind of cool. When we pull these things out, you like you never really it's just hard to remember. You I, don't always know. Yeah, you don't. You don't. So, yeah, I'm glad you dug that, too. The only other thing I thought you would enjoy just with the, uh, the a lot of the MTV references you were making was pretty clear Nike sponsorship in this movie. Oh, and good point. a lot of really cool early Nike stuff. I think um, at some point, Tina's is wearing like this awesome Nike, like pink, multicolored, like sweatshirt or something. Like that. That's a pretty some pretty cool gear in here for old Nike heads. but. Yeah, uh, I'm glad we did it. Uh, We'll do more of them in the future, I'm sure, moving forward. But uh, I rented it on Amazon Prime. It's on Peacock as well, I think. But I think I let my Peacock. Oh, is it on Peacock? Oh, damn. I could have watched it. Yeah, yeah, I I saw it on Peacock. Well, there's like the universal search on PlayStation. So it shows you where everything is. Um, I got to start using that. But for me on Peacock, it's, it's very useful. But on Peacock, it said like free with commercials or something i'm like oh so i must have let my subscription oh, last. okay and okay. i fuck i'm not doing commercials um <laughs> all right Dave. well uh, let's leave it over f- to you for a dad joke you know i gotta say too you made the kevin McAllister point before but the the part with the the booby trap the sledgehammer booby <laughs> trap was just like took me right back to home it, alone it's dude I, I it was so it's so funny like i was i'm like is this supposed <laughs> to be funny i think this is funny, but I don't know. Uh, I, th- I think so. I, it must cross over into satire after a fashion, right? It's got to. All right, Carl. So dad joke today. Carl, I decided to sell my vacuum cleaner. Yeah, it was just gathering dust. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. That's a good one. Nice basic one. Not bad. Not bad. No, yeah, not classic. Classic. Not at all. Well, Dig, thanks for your time today. Glad we thank got you. to I had fun. We got to do this. Likewise, thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of our show, Knockback, and all things on Last Stand Media. Remember, support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash last stand media. Buy your merch, laststandmedia.shop. And you want know to call your mother. She misses you. Oh, she does? I'm our saying, mother misses them? No, I'm just saying generally out there. Their mother. Know, of course, mom misses you. But yeah, call your mother. She and I'll see you in Pennsylvania, Hawaii yes. people, and Alaska people. Yes, everyone from all the 50 states will see you soon. Uh, and that's basically it. So we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Goodbye. 
Knockback, a retro and nostalgia podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from Central Virginia and the Philadelphia suburbs, USA. The show is conceived by and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Dagan Moriarty. Knockback's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Knockback, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 